We are starting the last day of our symposium, and the session will be about new therapeutic approaches. Okay, so uh, Fernanda, are you there? Yes. Please, could you introduce our famous Dr. Margaret? Well, I'm not. Uh, uh, Marielena, don't tease me, okay? Don't tease me. No, I'm not teasing you. Please. You are. When I say something, I say something for sure. Yeah. No, it's a pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Margaret Dalcom. She's a famous researcher um, in Brazil, a famous pneumologist, and uh, she has been running several clinical trials regarding to tuberculosis treatment in the last few years. And uh, she's from Phil Cruz and also a uh, very important person for us here in Brazil regarding to TB control. She has uh, been taking part in several consensus. She is internationally famous regarding to her player as uh, playing as a very important researcher relating to uh, TB treatment. Um, in another country and outside. So it's really, really a pleasure to introduce her. And I'm sure that we're going to see a very nice lecture and uh, with several updates regarding to TB treatment. And uh, please, Dr. Margaret, it's be a great opportunity to watch your, your class, your presentation. Thank you so much, Fernanda. And now uh, I need my presentation. Where is my presentation? Should I do it to share the screen? Or you do it, Marielena? How is it done? Share your screen. You have the bottom, green bottom. Share the screen. Okay. Okay. Here I go. So and now. Mode of presentation. Mode of presentation. Oh my God, oh my God, it entered something here. Oh my God, okay. So, uh, so it's my pleasure. To the app, to the app display setting. The app, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Swap yeah. presenter? Yes, yes. Okay, is it okay now? Yes, very nice. Yes. So I would like, first of all, to thank the generals and a bit exaggerated presentation made by Fernanda, but we are friends and it's my pleasure to be here attending to the uh, Marielena's invitation. So Marielena doesn't uh, actually doesn't invite us. She gives us an order and we have to comply with. And this is what we do when Marielena urges us to make something. So I don't have any conflict of interest with this presentation. And what I am going to comment on, it's about the, the difficulties and, the, and what we have in terms of perspective of mycobacteriosis treatment, except tuberculosis. I'm speaking basically about non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. So uh, think about uh, it is the first concept I would like to raise to you. The diagnostic is too long. We have to collect a specimen or to have a microscopic exam. And we have to make culture and culture take eight to 12 weeks. And then you have to make drug susceptibility. And then you have uh, prefer preferably uh, make the, the molecular identification. So the second concept I would like to raise is that our laboratories definitely need to switch from phenotype uh, kind of mycobacteria to molecular uh, kind of diagnostic cultures uh, include both solid and liquid media broth media have a higher yield solid media low observation of colored morphology and identification of the strains and this is more or less the 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 the, the molecular tree of the main uh, frequent mycobacteria according to this publication uh, from uh, 2007. And that is replaced now in this year, the current year uh, with the new one. So when to treat this kind of diseases? So we have a permanent dilemma, dilemma, because if we do underdiagnose, 
uh, we are going to to sort of uh, estim uh, stimulate the disease progression. If you will do over diagnosis, we are going to deal with drugs to toxicity. And so this is a clinical permanent dilemma that I am sharing with you. So. To, to take this decision, to make up our minds, we have to think about who is the patient? Uh, is it having, uh, are we having increased susceptibility uh, tests? Uh, we have to consider clinical symptoms and overall conditions of the patient, extent of radiographic abnormalities and whether there is evidence of progression with disease, considering that we don't have any validated marker of progression. We have to consider who is the organism or the pathology the pathogen, the species that has been isolated, bacteriological load, smear positive versus smear negative, and the overall of therapy. What do you want with uh, in deci deciding to treat a patient? Do Would you want to cure, to have a bacteriologic conversion, to have relief of symptoms, or to have prevention of progression? This is our dilemma permanent. So in our service, and basically in Brazil, we deal with the following the ATS and, and IDSA recommendations. So we deal with two positive smear culture or ball and bone marrow biopsy or histopathology. We do consider the type of patient, as I mentioned before. So these are def definitely including in Brazil emerging diseases the, with in US an annual increase uh, of 80% a year since 2010, basically compromising uh, elder patients and with a very, very high cost of treatment, basically in hospitalizations and 13% in, in outpatients and oxygen domiciliary provided. So when we look at the prevalence of this, uh, of this, uh, if if we do look back to the literature, we are going to see many, many papers. But what I would like to comment on this slide is the difference between a period. So this is to confirm my first concept that we are dealing with emergent diseases. Look at this difference between some years in all these papers already published, and they are published in a very seminal paper published some years ago, showing the difference in prevalence, considering a, 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 a relative, I would say, long uh, a time of observation, 10 years, nine years, and 10 years in different uh, papers published. This is a paper that we have published together with some colleagues in Portugal in order to, the, to respond whether the prevalence of micro, atypical mycobacteria in Brazil and Portugal, considering our population, we have a very high uh, uh, orig, original uh, Portuguese population in Brazil, and this is the distribution uh, of, of pathogen and non-pathogenic mycobacteria. This, this, well, this is a paper where I participated with this, this colleague from Portugal. It's an elegant paper for the ones that have interest in know about a little bit more about the pattern in Brazil as well as in Portugal. This is another paper that we have published last year, one year ago, considering and uh, this this pathogen that really treat, threats us, which is mycobacterium abscessus pulmonary diseases. And we made a meta-analysis considering everything we could find out published in terms of these pathogens. And so these are the, the main uh, papers that we have analyzed, including the first one published by Fernanda Mello, who is here among us. And most of them, as you can see, in, 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 uh, instead of being prospective papers, are retrospective cohorts, most of them. And so, and most of them, type of drug regimens uh, were dealt with individualized or customized treatment instead of protocol. It's very difficult to have. And this is the reason why all the evidence, almost all the evidence we are dealing with are uh, uh, evidences that uh, do not respond to, uh, to, the, to the level A evidence because we don't have clinical trials, randomized and controlled one in, in list. Uh, uh, of uh, of um, uh, other uh, control studies this this type and this is uh, the result of our meta analysis considering the association of individual drugs with treatment success what we can comment on this slide is that the 
the, the results are very poor in terms of negativation of culture and, um, and, the, and the, the, the clinical result of these patients. This is again the, the presence of uh, aminoglycosides in all these treatments considering this, uh, this resistant, this increasing resistant pattern uh, is, definitively, uh, is definitively making a difference when we do compare the resistance of monoglycosides and the presence of the aminoglycosides. The other thing that we have to consider, particularly when, and when we are treating these emerging diseases, are the conditions that predispose to these pulmonary diseases. So in, in terms of surviving with cystic fibrosis, HIV, and what something that is really demonstrated today, which is the Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial diseases are some, some issues that I would say that have been taken into account in order to decide whether you are going to treat or not. This is more or less the pattern considered. I have to be very quick in my presentations only to provide you some very uh, good uh, publications about this, uh, this uh, prevalence of this um, this pathogenic um, mycobacteria, and this is comparing a European country in where the prevalence is more or less low, and in an Asian country where we know the prevalence of all these mycobacteria are much higher and known for a long while already. The another, another thing that it is important is the, the presence the, of, the vir of the bacterial load. For instance, in this slide uh, published a long time ago, and it is still true because it's already repeated in this, in this year, uh, guidelines just published some months ago. So the presence of a, a very uh, high, uh, heavy load of bacteria is consistent with progression of disease. And so I am showing this um, definitively in order to figure out about the importance of this information. So in terms of treatment regimens, uh, what do we need, what we expect in terms of goals and considering the susceptibility of this, this pathogens vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the drugs or regimens we are using, considering that we never are going to treat these pathogens with one single drug or we have to treat at least three drugs to treat this. Mycobacterium kansasi, the, the question that we have to respond is whether they are susceptible to these drugs, we could expect uh, a very high rate of cure. But it depends if they, uh, to this year, the, the, the current guidelines just published, considered with a very, I would say, more or less uh, low or high uh, consistent uh, of evidence level to put a macrolide together in this treatment as well. And in terms of myco mycobacterium abscessus, this is the, the worst result. Uh, this is the, 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 the biggest threat we are facing in, all over the world, including in Brazil, because our, because our expectation is not higher than 50% of a cure. In terms, of, uh, in terms of treatment, for avian complex, for instance, uh, what we are considering according to the, 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 late, the, the latest publications is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, if the patient is susceptible to microlide or not. This is the first question to be responded. And if it is not, we have to associate at least four drugs. And uh, in terms of new drugs, it's only a comment that I would like to, to raise. Uh, we know that some colleagues in, in US are using off-label uh, the bedaquiline, which is the new drugs, uh, uh, already approved, included in Brazil recently by Conitec to be incorporated for tuberculosis treatment and they are using for um, non-tuberculosis mycobacteria in an off-label way in US. So in terms of uh, uh, treatment, uh, we use this all this in some cases, basically the susceptibility to Digesiclin is the highest one that we are having. We still have it, including in Brazilian samples. It's very similar to the literature in the US. Uh, major conditions, recommendations with weak evidence are just uh, recently being published, as I said. 
So this, uh, these guidelines uh, recently published worked on a systematic review based on 22 PICO questions which respond to uh, intervention, comparator, population and outcome and the recommendations use the grade approach to be uh, used. And so which, kind, uh, which issues are more relevant are the resistance of refumping in Kansas and Avion. So it does complicate a lot, the response and the recommendations. The role of macrolides, uh, they are increasing and the resistance to macrolides is also increasing, particularly when we do consider mycobacterium abscessos. The presence of cavitation, it can change the outcome of the treatment. The use of intermittent regimens, of course, we are allowed, ethically allowed to use more and more, and particularly when the patients are, or the strain are susceptible to microlides. The role of surgery and the role of surgery, despite not having a control, I would say, study, but it is a universal consensus that if the patient have uh, unilateral disease, we can submit uh, to surgery. And the duration of treatment is also something that has to be responded in further studies or further guidelines. This is the last guideline that we have. Uh, in terms of the mycobacterium, I am in the last uh, pre last slides. In terms of mycobacterium abscessus, we have three species or subspecies, and there is a difference in terms of ex expectation in terms of cure or good outcome. Uh, considering Massiliensis and subspecies abscessus, abscessus, which seems to be the worst in terms of clinical response. And I could tell you that in our experience in Brazil, it's the same thing. We are finding out the same uh, type of uh, results. Uh, in terms of uh, Brazilian data, only to provide you some information for the ones that are not from here, we are increasing the, the number of reported cases in our database. Uh, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo are the states that most uh, report cases of N N M N T. And we have this database that concentrates all the reporting of these uh, cases to be treated with, uh, and we do provide the regimens that are uh, adopted and considered validated, although they are not a controlled trial. And uh, in terms of um, of conclusions, I would say that N N N T M R emergent diseases and increased prevalence even in Brazil. Uh, we submitted to the Minister of Health and finally the Min Brazilian Minister of Health and Fernanda and I, we take part of the steering committee that are sort of uh, writing the new guidelines for the Brazilian uh, conducts uh, of these uh, diseases. And there are some risk factors to be better determined in our population. Laboratories should, should switch from final. Uh, phenotypic to molecular methods, species, definitions, and drug susceptibility tests, and treat or not, it remains based on who is the patient, what is the pathogen, and the outcome that we do expect. What are our expectations in terms of to provide a better quality of life for this person? And the results of treatment uh, remain suboptimal and vary according to the species and the subspecies of the strain that we are dealing with. So this will be, Maria Elena, my comments on this issue, and I am ready to respond some questions if we do have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Margaret. And um, I would like to, to know if there were some questions There is a question for you, Dr. Margaret. NTM infection usually go go up in the place where tuberculosis goes down. How you explain that NTM in Brazil is going up if the TB is still high incident in the country. Well, Marielena, 
I, I wouldn't like to be simplistic in this response because, of course, it is complex. Uh, tuberculosis, you have to figure out that despite its being, it remains in a higher, I would say, level of incidence in Brazil, it decreased in this last 20 years, first of all. It decreases very, very slowly. We should be reducing 15, 1, 5 a year, and we are reducing 2% a year. So it's something that really worries us. The second issue, which is considerably, I would say, relevant in Brazil, is that we are having a, a higher life expectancy in Brazil. We have already 11% of our population over, over 60 years. And you have to understand this, these diseases are related to age, to age as well as to some, I uh, would say, comorbidities. And so it's not difficult to explain that they have to be considered, uh, I would say, emergent diseases. And last but not least, we are dealing with different strains. We are having more abscessos, and abscessos is something a little bit new in our universe. And this is something that we have in our database, for instance, for you to be aware of, we have almost 300 cases of mycobacteria and abscessos. And so this is the reason why we, we could be uh, part of this recent published meta-analysis is about this. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm having some uh, problem here. Let me see. Fernanda would like to make some question. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I'm trying to fix, well, I'm going to make without my video. I think I have some trouble here right now, but... Yes, I am having some okay. trouble also. Okay. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Margaret for her nice, wonderful uh, presentation. She showed all the big issues that are related to NTM right now in Brazil, in the world. And uh, I'd like to ask her what she thinks about um, the diagnosis of NTM. How can we improve it? The importance to make pneumologists and clinicians and uh, because our feeling is that we are still uh, it's increasing because you have new diagnosed tests that allow us to detect it, but we needed to make, I, I, do, I do believe that uh, it's necessary to make people understand that it's really an important disease right now and, uh, and how to deal with it, to make people understand that it's a problem right now in our country and a very expensive problem and that our system and how does she believe that our you know, switch, our system of health care in Brazil should deal with it right now. Well, it's a very good question, Fernanda, and this is some sort of dilemma that we are living every day. It's the real world, I would say, that you are speaking about. Well, first of all, I fully agree with you that the clinicians should think about this possibility. They have to be more aware. And I hope that the, the guidelines that we are about to publish with a with, a, with a, the Minister of Health uh, approval uh, could sort of um, stimulate people to think, uh, particularly in older people. And secondly, the other issue that you have raised is about labs. Our labs are not making diagnostic. We are not thinking about, we are not asking uh, uh, diagnostic method. So in our labs, as I said, should switch from phenotypic methods to genotypic methods uh, and we have to have uh, i would say sequencing uh, sequencing or we have to have molecular method in order to establish the real i would say uh, strain and the real species and with this to define uh, a reasonable a more reasonable or acceptable treatment we have uh, we have um a time for a last question, more one question, and uh, thank you, uh, Fernanda. From Luana, question from Luana Correa. Can only mycobacteria result in calcified granuloma? Negative PPD is possible with granuloma? 
totally asymptomatic and without drug treatment. I ask this in the context where only image suggested the infection immunosuppression suppressed patient. I guess I guess this this uh, I guess this colleague is speaking not about NTM but about tuberculosis itself because PPD uh, to be considered uh, the, not the tubercolin tests but but the skin tests related to NTM are not being used except in some researches so it, it, it does not it's not inter, it's not important it's not relevant I would say but to responding the question that that is raised about tuberculosis uh, PPG response uh, is not something that nowadays we, we do consider in, in terms of defined treatment alone. PPG positive or negative does not do with the presence of disease. If, for instance, the, the disease is active, the disease is very severe. PPG is important to define the treatment of latent infection, which I would say the profiting on this moment that it is the crucial, I would say, measure to control tuberculosis dissemination in the world. So it's not correct to leave the patients to be ill, to be treated, but instead we have to invest heavily in terms of detecting latent infection and to provide proper treatment to, la to latent infection of tuberculosis. So this is the importance of PPG or tuberculin tests, as well as IGRA tests. And, uh, and I do expect, Maria Elena, that Conitec, for the ones that are not aware, Conitec is this real, uh, this, this uh, week, analyzing to be uh, to approve or not the incorporation of IGRA tests. And please, the ones that can still respond to the public consultation, do it. Because we need it for immunosuppressed patients, for the candidates to use immunobiological and other special cases, at least. Thank you very much, Dr. Margaret. Your time is out. And a very nice uh, talk. And uh, other questions, please, we will send it to you. If you have time, you may respond. Please, Dr. Margaret, could you introduce Dr. Fernanda? What? You are going to give me this pleasure, Marilena. I am, yes. I am highly suspect because, yeah. you know, to introduce, to do, I am biased. <laughs> I have conflict of yeah. interest, yeah. but I assume <laughs> them. But I assume them to introduce Fernanda is not only a pleasure, but I am very proud to do it because Fernanda makes us, uh, her colleagues, proud to live with her. Fernanda is a full professor at the University, the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro of Respiratory Diseases. And Fernanda has been conducting trials for all this at least 20 years. Fernanda is responsible to the Instituto do Tórax, has been her, its director, and Fernanda is a professor very well recognized by the students and by her colleagues. This is the, the reason why I am very proud to introduce her, and I, give, I have the pleasure to give her the floor. The floor is yours, Fernanda. Yeah, thank you. Before you, you know, Fernanda, please. Uh, Fernanda, uh, please. I would like to deliver a message for uh, Dr. Margaret from Dr. Cardona. Congratulations, Margaret. A great talk. <laughs>